a whole range of possibilities out there that we might consider. So I think that's where A-level students will have to be, that kind of idea of independent or what Margaret Roberts would call an open inquiry. So those, if you like, are the points that were shown in that previous diagram where I showed that inquiry was a kind of, there were the two green blobs, if you like, that showed how it was rather like uh, going through a task-led process. Margaret Roberts' uh, bullet points there about what the inquiry process actually involves, the, the six that are highlighted in, in red text there are the six that are done in, in the most closed situations. And actually, there are all those other stages of the inquiry process that I think that are getting missed. And I think that that's where we may want to take an opportunity now to say, look, how do we get those back? And it may seem something of a, if you like, an anachronism to say, well, examinations might be the way forward in doing this. But few students at the moment are encouraged to be creative at that stage. Um, you have many students who now write to a kind of checklist. You know, they've got a list of things they've been given to include from their teacher about what you do when you evaluate and so on. So I think if we can just open up and just break away from that, we, we, we may find that perhaps the new GCSE specs will enable students to, to um, widen. Um, but there's a warning, because examinations, I'd have to say, I think traditionally, have not led a particularly um, clear, geographically good or sound way forward. You know, if we're trying to adopt past processes, we, we may be again missing a trick, because that's the kind of question, the kind of question highlighted in blue, um, which comes from many years ago, but it's not the sort of question I would ever really want to see on a GCSE paper, somehow. Describe how you would collect data about a river's width, depth, and velocity. And when, it, when you look at the mark scheme, I'll say, this is, this is going back many years. Look at the mark scheme, it says, well, how you collect width. You, well, you'd use a tape measure, tick one mark, and you'd measure the river at width, it, its width, one mark. And then you get a ruler, one mark, and you'd measure at several points across the river, one mark. And actually, you know, you don't have to do field work to do that. So I think that kind of question, if that's all we were to see, and I stress <laughs> if that's all we were to see, I, I think we'd, we, we'd be on a kind of, I don't know, almost a kind of soulless um, way, way forward. The, the other way, I'd, I'd, I'd say there's another risk, I think. In fact, there are two other risks, but this one I think is particularly true. There have, there have been some examination questions at AS where students have been expected to do field work and where it has been examined now since 2008. And you get students ask the question, you know, explain how you would carry out field work in an area of urban regeneration to show whether it had been a success or not. And students have to lie. Because I've yet to meet any students who are in any way involved in the planning process of that, where the teacher says, right, this is what we're going to do. Go away, think for a while, brainstorm. How are we going to do it? Now, I'm sure out there, there are some teachers doing that. I just haven't met them, and you don't see it in examinations. Because if you get a pile of white paper scripts that have all come from the same school, you'll get one or two students who are doing it, and actually you go through the rest of the pile, they're not doing it. That one student is going to learn to play the game. And I think sometimes that's, that's a kind of false thing to do as well, getting students to play a game. I don't think that's geographically valid at all, even though I'm sure it goes on, and goodness knows, if I'd been a teacher and I hadn't done that, I would be encouraging my students to do it. So, yeah, we may all have done it. I just think it's, it, it doesn't lead to good assessment. It doesn't lead to good messages about field work. The other one is, is and I know at least one awarding body, you know, banks quite a lot on this at AS, which is to have a geographical skills paper. And I know that, you know, from a work with another awarding organisation back in the day, there used to be something called a techniques assessment with one of the A-levels that I worked with many, many years ago. And the trouble with the techniques assessment with statistical skills, it turns your rank order of students upside down because it's the ones who can cope with mathematical skills and handling data, particularly in an unseen situation, who score the best marks. And very often, they're the ones who don't often do very well, say, on taught papers. So you get students doing very well on taught papers, don't do so well on skills papers, and vice versa. Result, you get a bunch of marks in the middle, and it's very hard to differentiate over, overall. So skills papers aren't, aren't problem-free either. So how do we do it? Well, I think these things do help. These are new assessment objectives. There are three at the moment in the current batch of GCSEs, and we're moving to four. And I think they're actually quite helpful, because AO1 
is just simply about knowledge recall. Okay, now you could argue that that fieldwork question I showed you from an exam was largely about knowledge recall, but look how little, and that's for the whole of the GCSE qualification, look how little knowledge recall takes up. So the new GCSE sample assessments, when you look at those, are going to be really quite short on questions that simply ask for knowledge recall. Now, AO2 does have a sense of recall about it, but it's about understanding. Now, if somebody asked me to explain how a car engine worked, I would just simply go to the internet or a textbook and I'd mug it up. And if I then had a question like that, I'd pour it out on paper. Actually, I think understanding is the, is the thing that I wouldn't be doing. I don't understand how a car engine works. I can pick out various bits and I could give you, you know, but I'll probably phone Andy because I know he's a bit of a, a car person. He does know how a car engine works. But the sort of knowledge that we learn and where we have to explain doesn't necessarily guarantee that we really, really understand it. Do we really understand about the disadvantages of the Three Gorges Dam? Well, we, we might do. Do we really get to grips with it? Well, no, but we can learn it and we can reproduce it in an exam paper. However, when you get to AO3, I think you get to the real nub, a much higher level skill, which is where you get to 35% of the new GCSEs are going to be application. And look at them in brackets there, 10% of the marks there are coming from field work. No field work in AO1, no field work in AO2. So there's a, there's a sense there already. How are we going to get students to apply something well, I think you've got to do the groundwork first in getting students engaged so that they really do genuinely understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. And part of that process is AO4 about selecting, adapting and using a variety of skills and techniques. And again, if you look overall, that's 25%, but 5% is, is, is uh, marks from fieldwork. So if you add the marks together for fieldwork, it means that 15% of the new GCSE qualifications are going to be from uh, fieldwork. But it's all AO3 and all AO4. So the routine, if you like, the, the recall you know, is, isn't there. Now, you could argue, look, you know, describe how you would measure the width, depth, and velocity of a river. Is that a skills question or is that a knowledge recall question? Well, I'll leave you that to, to, to think about and decide. But it might be a good thing for you to do when you're looking at the, the sample assessment materials to think, right, OK, are there messages here in the sorts of field work that we ought to be doing with our, with our students? So that's, that's a big change. So I think really what we have to think about then is how do we open up possibilities in classrooms to engage with that application and that skills process? And I think that we, we can't do that properly unless we engage students with thinking geographically. That we have to get them to think in terms of planning. If we've avoided doing any sort of planning work, selecting skills, planning skills, using skills, maybe doing things slightly differently vis-a-vis -vis one group, uh, and another, I, I think we have to get students engaged with that process. And, and it rather in, involves, I think, thinking about uh, inquiry in a, in a rather broader sense. So, you've seen that slide once before, but actually last time I put the, the, the red as, the, as what are now, if you like, there are three bullet points in black in the top right-hand box and then three in the bottom right-hand box. All the other points are in red. That, that's where I think our focus needs to go to try and make that field work process much more holistic. Carry on, don't avoid doing the things that we've been doing in terms of using data and making sense, but reflecting on learning and creating a need to know. Think is actually though, you know, maybe there's gonna be more than one chance to get this right. You know, field work might just be part of a, of a learning process. That would be, you know, if you like what I've called here the, ch the challenging bits. But, there are some, some pitfalls. You know, your, your students may say to you, well, you know, what about if we find that the results don't fit what's in the textbook? Yeah, well, fine. It's a real environment. Um, and and they, they can engage with that. But it's challenging. And, and, and it, is, it is messy geography. So, too, is to get students, if you like, taking away the scaffolding a little bit and saying, well, you know, how well did your data collection go? You know, could you have done it any better, do you think? And actually, that self-critical thing, which some students might really find quite threatening, unless it becomes part of an overall learning, if you like, culture in, in, in the classroom. And so I think where we have to start is what are we doing out in the field in the first place? And what are the wider geographical ideas of which fieldwork can form a part? 
And, and that's where I hope Educas have, have really got something to, to help you with and, 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 and help you rethink field work. And the first principle is that we believe that learners should be actively involved, that they've got to be thrown, if you like, that, that not just messy results stage, but actually even the messy planning stage. You know, to do dummy runs, to, instead of before going, going off to an urban environment, getting onto Google Maps and getting a kind of warm up to see what the area might, might be looking like, to, to go and see it in a kind of virtual world, and then to think, well, how could we collect data? And, and getting students to go off and find, you'll, you'll, have I, you'll have IT whizzers in your classes, every single class has got them, who will be using apps, who will you know, be real ICT whizzos in thinking about how you collect data, how you use data. You know, give them their day, let, let, them, let them lead a bit and let them recommend to others what, what kinds of smartphone apps they might like to use, about where should data be collected and what kind of fieldwork reports should they write. It doesn't have to be you know, the 2,000 word written report anymore. Actually, I've got something to say about that later on. I think it does involve writing something, but it may not be a written report. It might be a broadcast. It might be a you know, radio. It might be a PowerPoint presentation. It might be a blog. It might be a, you know, a, a podcast, whatever. It may, there's all kinds of possibilities out there. So that the, if you like, the outcome largely depends, for instance, on what kind of inquiry you've been doing. So if you want to find out if the, if the local you know, proposal for a Tesco superstore you know, half a mile away from the school is valid, but then there's an app called InfoBabble, which will give you little 20 second um, interviews with, with, with people out, well, it could be anywhere. So you could be asking people, get 20 seconds of their viewpoints. You could use it, you could use the sound, rather than having to type it all up and go through all of that, you could use the sound as part of a presentation. So really opening up in that respect, so that students get a, a sense of wider understanding. And, and I won't say a lot about that in, in this lecture, but I think that one of the purposes of field work, if we do it right, is we begin to think, is what I've found here about this city centre or this river or, or this suburb, whatever, or about this superstore proposal, does it have a wider application? Is it going on elsewhere in the UK? And in specifications which are all going to have to take account of a wider UK dimension, I think making that link between the local and the national and you know, the conceptual, if you like, the global almost, I think is, is very important. And so there are two approaches. What EDUCAS has come up with is, is not to say, well, you can do rivers or coasts, urban or rural. That would actually have been a very easy way around it because it would have allowed almost limitless possibilities. But actually to say, look, when geographers go out and, and do field work, they engage with certain methodologies. And so I'll show you in a minute the four methodologies that, that EDUCAS have, have, have come up with. And, and these won't all have to be done in any one year. You'll do one in any one year, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. And a focus on one geographical concept. So it might be a concept like, for instance, sustainability. And that's your brief. Right? So it might be, for instance, about flows. You might think, oh, good, I can do rivers. Or you might be thinking about a city centre. Oh, hang on, I could do flows of people. I might do both. I might do flows in rivers and in city centres. I might be thinking about flows of people nationally. I might be thinking of flows of people, you know, if you're particularly, if you're one of those teachers who gets, you know, a sort of dreadful blood pressure whenever you see Nigel Farage on television, you might know, be one of those teachers who sort of says, I want to think about, you know, migrant flows of people from within Europe and think about my local area and that. So I want to talk, look at flows of people and who lives where and where they've come from. You could think about flows in any particular way. The only constraint will be that in your two environments that you use, that you have contrasting environments. That's, that's, that's the requirement. And so you might be thinking, well, actually, I could do a day on flows and a day on sustainability, or I could take them to two different places, and we could look at flows and sustainability in each place. You can really do what you want. And there are lots of suggestions. Before I sort of send you sort of peering over into an abyss of limitless possibilities, in the new draft specification, Educas have very helpfully put together some ideas for what you could do for flows. And here are, for instance, the ideas. This is the methodologies. So when you look at, for instance, you'll find use of transects is one of the methodologies. You know, geographers use transects routinely. That might be a transect across a meander. 
might be a transect through a CBD, it might be a, a transect between, say, inner city and outer city, or between outer city and urban rural, um, in order to try and get a sort of urban rural continuum. It might be change over time. It might be qualitative surveys. It might be geographical flows. You can see when you look at those that actually when you, 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 you're thinking about those, you're going to be thinking of two things. AO4 skills, what skills am I going to get them to use? But also AO3, what application am I going to get the students thinking about? So this flow of this river, well, if it gets faster downstream, do all rivers get faster downstream? Always? Does it always happen like that? You know, what, what, what might we be doing? And before, again, that, that seems like limitless possibilities, um, there's a different focus for each exam cycle. So you'll have one focus. So in 2016, you'll know then that one of those will be assessed in 2018 and another one in 2019, a different one. And if you start thinking, well, hang on, do I have to go to a different fieldwork location then every year? Well, if it is use of transects in year one, and you've got your favourite river and you're a passionate get your wellies on kind of geographer, do transects across river channels or transects across river valleys to show what transects reveal. Um, if you've got then change over time and you want to look at then changing river channels downstream over time, to using primary and secondary data to show how river channels change, you can do that. And in the third year, qualitative surveys, environments and the value of coastal landscapes might be the value of river landscapes. So you can keep going back to the same place, but it means to say that you'll have just a slightly different emphasis in each, in each cycle. And they will be publicised two years in advance. So if you're on a three-year GCSE at the moment, you'll have to wait a year before you know what the focus is going to be. Um, am I right in saying it will be 2016? Yeah, the, the first year. Because it'll be 2018. So you'll have, you know, you're starting in 2015 on a three-year cycle. You just have to wait a year until you know what the first cycle is going to be. But it does offer up a lot of possibilities. Similarly, when you look at the conceptual frameworks, now it's four methodologies. Again, any of those could be used. But these six conceptual frameworks, place, you might think, well, does that mean, does that mean if, if you're, for instance, teaching um, the AO that um, has an AS which looks at rebranding places at the moment, does that mean to say we're going to be doing that kind of work? Well, you could do. You could look at regeneration and changing places. Or it might be characteristics of two landforms, two coastal stretches in order to demonstrate, say, a coastal spit versus cliffs, arches, stacks and, and the rest of it. And you could look at the sense of place, the distinctiveness of place through coastlines. And then sphere of influence, um, cycles and flows. Well, you don't need me to re read those off the, off the screen, but you can see that when you start looking at those, actually, you begin to think that really, you know, that, that there's, there's a lot of possibility there. And you might think, well, they, don't these look mainly human kinds of concepts? Well, they do, but think about them in physical concepts, context like place, the distinctiveness of two coastal areas. Uh, it could be sustainability. For instance, you could look at sustainability in coastal management or sustainability in flood management. We've tried to make those as, as if, if you like, almost as limitless as possible because the main thing is that students get a grip of what mitigating risk means or what sustainability means or, you know, or what place means and they begin to think about that rather than, you know, have I done the right scatter graph to show river velocity downstream, which is what many of them are really concerned about at the moment. And again, those, you see, you can feel that application of, you know, how sustainable is this place is really quite an interesting question to ask if you're looking at regeneration or if you're looking at coastal management, that kind of question, if you generate that kind of question straight away, you can engage students with that as a, as, as, as a, as a question worthy of investigation. And then the AO4, if you like, the skills, that almost begins to follow on. So the question can, can arise out of the AO3, straight from the concept, straight into AO3, you're into application already, and then AO4, you're thinking about the sorts of skills that students might use in order to research that. And I think it's, it's designed to get away from this kind of route march almost of where people do the same thing every year. And it's, I think, with the best will in the world, the school I was referring to earlier with the three river points, I think they've just been doing it. In fact, I even had a note from the head of the department to say, look, you know, I think that uh, you know, uh, we, we, you know, we've been doing this for a bit too long. 
Now, I'm going to finish there because, A, there are people waiting at the door ready to come in, and secondly, because tomorrow, the second part of this session, is a workshop where we'll be exploring some of the implications of, of these four methodologies and six concepts in, in a field work and, and in a classroom context. So it'll be a workshop in, I forget the room, but it'll be in your, in your programmes, and it's first thing tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So if you'd like to come along then, we'll be welcoming you then as now. Thanks very much for coming along. Thank you.